Good day, everyone. This is Alan Schimmel of MediaOps, DevOps.com, Security Boulevard, Container Journal. Welcome to another MediaOps-sponsored webinar. Today's webinar is a roundtable. It's actually what we're calling a CTO fireside chat. And this fireside chat is, is the first installment in a series that we're calling CTO Talks. Um, here at Media Ops, and they're very happy that we're uh, sponsored for this series by our friends at Sonatype. And um, we'll be doing a series of these CTO talks over the coming weeks and months. But this is the first one, and we're real excited to have it. We, we have two great CTOs that we're going to be speaking with. But before I get into in, introducing them and into the subject matter of today's CTO talk and fireside chat, let me first spend a moment <clears throat> with our audience here and talk to you about how you can interact and become a real part of, of this event. Um, we do use the GoToWebinar control or the GoToWebinar system for this event. And for, and for many of you, that means you have the GoToWebinar control panel probably in the right-hand corner of your screen. I'm gonna ask you to draw your attention to that. And if you may, uh, you'll see there are several sections of that control panel. <clears throat> I want to call your attention to the section marked questions. And if you can click the arrow or carrot so it's downward facing, expanding the question section, you'll see that there's an interface here for you to type in your questions. I, I go to, you know, at, at these events using GoToWebinar, we're using text-based questions. You can type your questions in there, though, at any time. We're not organizing this where uh, we've set aside the end of the panel or the end of the session for questions. We'll be taking questions throughout the event. But if you could type your questions in there as they pop into your mind, we'll try to get to them in a timely manner. You don't have to worry about remembering your question or asking it at the proper time. If you just pop it in there when, when it pops in your head, we'll, we'll do our best to get to it. On top of that, if we get so many questions, and there are, I, I have to tell you, for a lot of people registered for this event, we're expecting a nice crowd. If we get so many questions that I can't, we can't answer them all. The nice thing about popping them in there is we do have a record of them. We could ask our panelists after the fact to send you written responses so that your questions get asked, answered. Your questions are important to, to our whole event because quite frankly, the only reason we do this is, is for the audience. So any questions of our panelists about the subject matter, please put them in the question section and we'll take care of it. For technical issues, maybe audio is cutting in and out, the video is not in sync or not, uh, you know, slide. well, there's only one slide, you don't have to worry about slides progressing. But if you have any kind of technical issue, but you can still get into the chat section of the webinar. Um, we use chat for tech support, not for questions. Questions go in the question section, but we use chat for tech support. We do have folks standing by who will jump on your technical issues and do our best to answer them and solve them so that you can get the full enjoyment of, of today's uh, fireside chat roundtable. So chats for technical support, questions are for questions. Just a couple of other things. Yes, this is being recorded. The entire recording and uh, event will be available on demand, usually within just a few uh, hours, one or two hours after uh, the live event. On top of that, we are giving out four Amazon gift card winners to winners who will be joined at the end of the event, and I'll announce them towards the end. I see we got our first question in there, and I'm real happy to have it. We're going to get to it in just a bit. But now let me introduce you to our two CTOs for today's CTO talk. First of all, I'm really happy to have my friend Brian Fox. From uh, Sonatype, Brian is a CTO, and Brian, if I'm not mistaken, you're a co-founder at Sonatype, or yeah, yeah, that's right. 
And so he's been there, you know, all through the, 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 you know, he's seen it grown up with Nexus and the open source security community and DevSecOps and everything else. So Brian, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thanks. Secondly, another friend of mine, uh, we have Josh Steller, who's the CTO of Fugue. And, and Josh, thank you for joining us today. Alan, it's great to be here. Good to talk again. Yep. So guys, we're going to, you know, the, the, we have an agenda to go into today, and it's really about kind of what's on the horizon in security and, and developers for 2021 and beyond and, and, and so forth. Also going to talk a little bit about some joint functionality between Sonatype and Fugue and, and programs. But before we do, let, let's give a quick level set. I'm assuming most of our audience is familiar with Sonatype, but Brian, maybe there's some who aren't. And, and if you wouldn't mind taking just 30 seconds or 45 seconds and give us a little Sonatype background, and then Josh, if you wouldn't do mind doing the same with Fugue. Fair? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. So Sonatype, you know, we started Sonatype 13 and a half years ago. Um, you know, in the early days, very much focused on the Apache Maven build system and the ecosystem around it, <laughs> training. Uh, we're the company that runs the Maven central repository where the world gets its Java, uh, open source Java from. Uh, we we produce the uh, Nexus repository manager and and uh, for the last 10 years or so, we've also been working on uh, sets of tools to help developers uh, manage the, the dependencies for all kinds of reasons, including security and architecture quality license um, across the entire life cycle to help do a better job of leveraging open source dependencies. Uh, so that's that's uh, kind of the brief synopsis of what we've been up to. Fantastic, Josh. Sure. So Fugue is a uh, cloud security and compliance tool. We um, will examine cloud infrastructure environments, or in the case of what we're doing with Sonatype, infrastructure as code, uh, things like Terraform, for potential security violations, and um, we do that through the entire SDLC. So. Um, we're on AWS and Azure and Google Cloud launching imminently, and uh, we also do visualization of cloud environments. So if you if you want a Google map of your cloud environment with an overlay of uh, security issues, um, we can provide that. Excellent. So guys, we're going to talk. You know, we'll weave it into the fabric of this uh, about the partnership between Fugue and Sonatype and bringing cloud security and compliance into the development work streams. But I, I wanted to start at the high end, which is, you know, we're, we're here in January 14th, right? New year, and what a year 2020 was, right? But looking at 2021, what, what's on the horizon for developers and security teams? And you're both CTOs. How, how are some of the C-level folks out here or aspiring C-level folks, what should they be doing to kind of prepare and guide their teams into, into the uncharted waters of 2021? Who wants to start off on that? Brian, would you mind? Sure. Um, you know, I think with the solar winds slash solar burst uh, attack that's happened, I think it's, it's made uh, the software supply chain um, something that everybody's talking about, much in the way that Equifax several years ago made um, everybody aware of open source risk, right? Um, and so it's it's unfortunate, but I think it's a wake up call, and and you know we're seeing that that's becoming a persistent part of the conversation, and and that's something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. We've been talking about this for. 10 years or so, trying to help people think about the way they're assembling software these days, because let's admit modern software is more assembled than it is um, written from scratch, right? You're picking thousands of open source dependencies from the persistence to the network to the UI widgets and you're, you're wiring them all together, um, much the way uh, manufacturers assemble, you know, cars or planes, right? Um, you know, and and um, if you don't have a good supply chain practice for managing those things, then it's unsurprising when you end up with bad parts uh, in those those things you've assembled. And if you haven't kept track of them, how would you ever manage something the, the equivalent of a recall when you know that there's a problem? How do you know where it is and and, and make those changes? So um, 
So I think there's going to be a lot of focus on that. Finally, um, I think that's a good thing. It's been much needed, uh, and and related to that, you know, a, a trend that I've been watching for the past couple of years that's really uh, wow. last year kind of exploded even more is is the trend that many of the attacks being injected into the supply chain are actually um, targeting the developers and the development vi environments themselves, um, whereas historically a lot of security uh, practices have been set up to to catch things before it gets shipped to the end user because the end user was the one that was likely to get exploited or, or attacked. That's not gonna work when your developers and your development ecosystem is actually the thing under attack. And you, you know, you saw elements of that in Solar Winds, where it seems like um, their build system was somehow attacked and then used as a leverage point to to then insert stuff downstream. Right. So so we saw starting a handful of years ago, those types of new attacks where it was focused on the open source developers and the exploits were focused on company developers, not the end users. Um, and last year, those types of attacks exploded 400%. 400% uh, from small numbers, but it's probably going to grow even more this year um, because once once the bad guys start down a path, they rarely just stop, <laughs> right? It gets more and more sophisticated. So um, I think the open source supply chain has largely been for years uh, sort of security for obscurity while, while the bad guys were after different, you know, checking different doors, but now the door is open. And so I think the combination of those two things is now going to become a very persistent part of the conversation and something that fortunately there are plenty of tools already available to help solve that. Um, just not enough people know that they need them. Yeah, I would, I would completely agree with everything uh, Brian just said. And, you know, if you, is uh, of course uh, Sonotype spend a lot of time thinking about the supply chain from the perspective of the components that go into applications. We at Fugue think a lot about the access to cloud environments and cloud configurations. And if you look at, for example, uh, what we know from the news about the um, the Uber breaches, uh, you know, Uber didn't really talk about them much, but uh, there have been some reports that these were uh, uh, affected by, these were, or were done by getting access to private GitHub repos. And to echo what Brian was saying, the developers become a very desirable uh, attack surface for vendors, and that's doubly so in cloud. Uh, so I think that, that these new attack surfaces that are, that are not like perimeter defense stuff that people have been thinking about forever, those, those perimeter defense things still matter. They're just less relevant than they used to be. Uh, and what matters, uh, you know, primarily these days, if you're running on cloud, is, is your application safe, right? Are you, are you making sure the supply chain is checked for the application? Is the application code inheriting uh, bad things? And is it configured in a way that's not exploitable in the runtime? And those really become the new attack surface. Uh, the, the other thing I'd say for, for 21, in my view, is there's going to be much less focus on uh, things like operating system layer security. And the reason is that uh, as serverless applications take off and as applications in the cloud uh, are, are really all intrinsically or mostly intrinsically uh, distributed applications, the um, the places where you need to worry about security happen between the components uh, more than inside a quote unquote server. A lot of these things are just ephemeral, short lived. You know, lambda functions live for 15 minutes or less. So I think uh, wise CISOs are going to try to get their hands around that. Great guys, I have a question queue is already blowing up. So let me see if I can start working some of these in here. You know, on on the on the solo solo wins issue. Uh, Mike from the audience, if we had any elaboration on the how, and I think we've, um, I think we uh, have already hit it, right, a little bit, but do we have any elaboration on the how? And then what can businesses do to protect themselves from the assumption that their tools are going to be hacked like this and, and not be used, be used to facilitate an attack? 
Anybody want I'm to take not certain shot? I've seen anything where they know yet how exactly it got in. I think they kind of know what happened after they got in, but I haven't seen, I don't know, Josh, if you have other information about how they figured it out, but I did see a pretty detailed analysis that so showed some of the code that was injected was clearly intended to hide in plain sight. You know, they copied the coding practices and the class names and the structures and, and stuff like that. So they clearly had access to all of the source code and, and, had the time to create very specific targeted things um, and inject that code into in, into the build at least um, in a way that no, it wouldn't stand out even to the developers working on it, um, which that kind of implies something different than a prey and spray kind of approach, right? That's a very targeted attack. But I think the key was once it was in there, then it was perpetrated or, or perpetuated to all of its all of their downstream customers. Uh, Josh, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think that when you're talking about software supply chain, and Brian, you pointed this out, that modern application development is more kind of an assembly than an authorship process in many ways. You're you're borrowing the vast majority of code from components and libraries, and those might be ones that you've written internally, or if you're doing a lot of open source, it's certainly things you're getting uh, one way or another from the internet. Um, you know, security... To, to protect yourself from these things, the first thing is to be aware of them and to start paying attention and start putting tooling in place. But security is not an event. It's, 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 it's not like buying a car. It's like going to the gym. It's something you just <laughs> have to keep doing. Uh, and it is always an arms race. So it appears in the SolarWinds case, this was a sophisticated uh, state actor or state actor proxy. You know, that's tough. Uh, because if, if if they're very, very you know the, the term hacker originally meant a clever programmer uh, before it came to mean somebody who steals stuff, but it's very appropriate from what I've seen because the people who are stealing stuff and doing these things are very clever. So uh, you know there's no absolute protection, but putting a practice in place to even understand the supply chain where the dependencies are, uh, you know if you have a library if it's part of your code base that you're uh, seeing changes in in a pull request that don't make sense to the rest of the pull request, that might be something to really question and, and, and take a harder look at. Sure. Yeah, I you mean, know, certainly we can... we've seen many of the, the, the upstream attacks that I was referring to, um, you know, where, where uh, typo squatting, brand jacking, other kinds of things are happening in the open source projects. Um, you know, and, and at Sonatype, we've discovered and written about them seems like every week going back to at least October, um, there's been some pretty significant ones. And, and a common theme in many of those is that they're trying to inject back doors into whoever runs it. And it, it would th that would be your developers and your build tools, your CI CD pipeline is potentially getting backdoored when that happens. And, and, and you know, once once they have the back door, then things like what we were talking about with solar winds potentially become possible, right? So it, I don't think we know how, how the initial entry point there uh, occurred, but um, certainly these types of attacks are happening. And so how do you defend against it? Well, it starts by you know, putting the controls in place and understanding and helping guide your developers towards making sure they're picking the legit versions of these dependencies up front. Um, you know, at Sonatype, we've been working on capabilities to uh, detect fishy behaviors within components because we've seen cases where open source developers on actual popular projects themselves got attacked or their their credentials compromised and so then it, this wasn't a case of somebody creating a, a fake version of of a component um, but it was actually injecting bad things into an actual legit popular component and so how do you detect that you know we've been building mlai techniques to try and analyze What's been going on inside these projects? Does, does this look like a flyby committer or is the committer or the publisher uh, publishing from a part of the world that they've never done so before? Or is a very popular project suddenly adding a, a dependency nobody in the world has ever seen, right? These are all kind of uh, trends that we've seen in other malicious attacks. And so we've been building early warning indicators uh, 
you know, much like uh, credit card companies can, you know, when you swipe your card, they have to make a decision in a microsecond to 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 determine if this is a legitimate uh, uh, transaction or not. How do they do that? They build a profile on all of us as consumers and kind of understand, like, is this is this uh, transaction something that seems uncharacteristic uh, for for you? Right. And and we're basically doing that for the project so that we can in, in a flash, as soon as something appears, indicate there's something about this that's fishy because what we've seen in so many times is that it, it can take a while for the community to catch on to the fact that there is actual malicious code going on in this thing all the while, even if that's a week, two weeks, you know, uh, people are being exposed, right? So, um, you know, those are the kinds of things that are required to help avoid these types of problems. I'd say also, you know, m maybe we're a, a bit of an extreme case at Fugue because we write a uh, a cloud security SaaS, and so we're extraordinarily paranoid about what gets in our software. But uh, none of our developers can introduce new libraries or components they find on the internet without an approval process. And that approval process includes, uh, you know, license evaluation because uh, certain open source licenses are uh, better or worse depending on your business model. But also, you know, an assessment of of uh, how uh, how safe it seems, and, and this is very true in the JavaScript world too, right? Where the, the, the JavaScript world is a Particular. little wild west. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think developers, and I'm a developer, uh, we like new shiny stuff, um, but that's not always the best thing. And you can end up, if you let everyone pick whatever new shiny they want, you can end up with a lot of effectively attack surface. So if you think about every inherited component, every included component, uh, when you think about supply chain, that entire thing is attack surface. And there are N ways somebody can try to exploit it. Brian just talked about two, uh, or two or three. Um, so, uh, you know, not being, not having a big target is probably a, a good part of it too, you know, limiting what you need to worry about. Yeah, I think the challenge companies have is that at massive scale, that a process can't be manual anymore, not with the rate of, and, and in the early days when we were doing a lot of Maven focused stuff, I saw companies doing that and and the it becomes a, a, an impediment to innovation at, at some point, right? Um, and, and so that kind of led to us building the tools that are trying to make that automated assessment so that, you know, you can define the guardrails for your developers and say, in these types of applications, you're allowed to use these licenses or not. And in, in, in these types of applications, we're worried about this type of security and hygiene and kind of let them run, but, you know, keep them safe with the bumpers on the, on the side. Um, and, yeah, and that you know, becomes I, part of the challenge. I, I certainly wasn't advocating enterprise standards in large organizations for what libraries are useful. Or, you know, I, I've worked in national security environments where, like, I couldn't use the editor I wanted to. Come on, guys. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, you know, I hate that stuff. What I'm saying is, on a, on a, maybe on a team basis, you know, I spent some time at AWS, and that that two pizza team thing is pretty darn effective in the total ownership model where on a team basis, where there's an expectation as an, a, a broader enterprise that each team have responsibility for this, make mm -hmm. them aware they're going to be held accountable for it. Mm -hmm. And in, rather than making centralized decisions, you can allow distributed decisions, but they can be intentional decisions. Correct. The thing I think to avoid is just stuff appearing in your code base because some developer liked something they found on the internet. It's great if that developer finds it on the internet and runs it up the flagpole a little bit. I don't, again, I hate enterprise, you know, edicts because they do get in the way. Uh, but just have the lights on, you know, understand how much exposure you have. And, and of course, the automation and the tools are, are, are critical to that. Yeah, at some point of scale, it, it's, it, it transcends the ability for the humans to even understand the dependency tree anymore. You know, um, uh, in NPM, it's probably not uncommon that it's like, it, it can literally be a thousand to one. Um, you know, you pull in one direct dependency and it drags along a thousand more things. In Maven, it's more like 10 to 20, I would say, you know, on, on, on the Java side, just because the modules tend to be bigger than they are in NPM. But, you know, unless you've got some tools to understand that you may be using things that you don't even realize you have. And, and like Josh said, it's still part of the attack surface. Attackers don't care if you meant for that to be there or if it was on your list or not, it's there. 
Um, you know, so it, it goes to the number of dependencies that you're using. It also goes to trying to to reduce the, the surface and the number of versions of those things. We 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 had one uh, customer that we saw um, that was using something like 80 of the uh, at the time 84 different versions of Spring at the same time, which basically meant somewhere in their portfolio, they were vulnerable to all of the Spring vulnerabilities that had ever happened in the history of Spring. That's just kind of insane, right? So um, so, so you have to think about the, the version proliferation as well. I, I think the same problem, of unknown attack surface and kind of um, inherited issues happens in the cloud, non-application code world, but the infrastructure world as well, where where folks are building stuff in the cloud, and you know, I can build a global network in 10 minutes. Uh, that used to take a year, right? Well, I can run a script and do it. And devs are doing that all over the organization. Now you want them to go fast, right? But you have to have the lights on, you have to understand what's happening and be aware uh, of that attack service, just as a, as a, as a first and, and, and primary step. And I think that, you know, what, what uh, Sonotype and Fugue are doing together is really exciting along these lines in that, we're kind of combining those two uh, capabilities um, into, you know, a, 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 a single product offering uh, that can uh, can help, uh, you know, um, help you not just with application code but with infrastructure as code as well. Fair enough, guys. I, I got it. we're getting a lot of questions and I, yeah. I got to get them to them. Yeah. So, you know, we we've spoken. To did and, and there were a lot of comments too to what you guys are saying i encourage you to jump in the questions section and you can see some of them but one of the themes that i'm seeing in multiple questions is look you know as we try to confront this software supply chain security issue as devops teams as developers uh you know what tools do we do we pursue a point strategy in terms of devops tools or you know do we get tools that integrate the entire across the lifestyle do we stitch them together do we count on like fugue and sona type working together to give us that integration right it's you know kind of is it a holistic approach that we require from our tool vendors our security tool vendors here or are we are we condemned to forever be kind of yeah. So I think there, there's a couple of things. I think you need to uh, look at the tools and understand what are the things they're solving for. You know, if if you if you aren't careful, you end up with the least common denominator because you just want one tool and it might not do any of the things well. Um, but but it is important to look at um, tools that at least within their scope can span most if not all of the development life cycle for example like what we do with the source um the sea the dependency analysis and those kinds of things it doesn't do you any good in fact it's counterproductive to come along with a tool at the end of the release and find all the problems with the dependencies it's too late to easily fix those and and if the development team is using a different tool up front you're inevitably going to get the mismatch of opinion and what's important and and what's found and and not so you know we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we make sure that the results we can provide are consistent across the entire um, SDLC so that the security team is seeing the same thing that the, the tech leads are seeing is the same thing as the developer was when they were pulling it in um, so that that you know we can facilitate rational business focused conversations and not whose tool is better than than which but that's not to say that um, you know you you would expect uh, a tool to be awesome at all the things and I think that's where it's kind of interesting in what we're doing with fugue right that we've we've kind of laid that uh, sort of developer first control plane down uh, initially with what we did for the dependencies but um, you know with with the ability to do policy and define the guardrails allows us to take tools like what fugue is doing and take the findings that they have that they are uniquely specialized to understand that the infrastructure is code aspect of it and then take those findings and also make them relevant and visible across the entire SDLC right so I think you want you, you want to look for a way to be able to um, have a control plane that can do all those things and that allows you to to pull in the various pieces that make sense for the type of software that you're developing 
Yeah, I, I, I agree uh, uh, completely. A, a couple things come to mind. One, um, I think any uh, good tool is going to be able to function across the SDLC. And, and the, the reason I say that is if you're only focused on one area of the SDLC from a security and policy perspective on this stuff, that means you're going to have another tool in another place of it, it, part of the SDLC, and they will never agree. And if you get disagreement, you get two things. One, um, you're never going to be secure because there's going it's going to become political. It's going to become security versus developers. And that's a disaster. You, 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 you really need to penetrate that entire life cycle. Now, the scope of what you're doing across that life cycle, you know, might vary from tool to tool. I'm a big proponent of the Unix philosophy. You know, you, uh, make, uh, make small programs or narrowly scoped programs that do things extraordinarily well, that do things extraordinarily well and can easily be integrated with other things. So, for example, at Fugue, we care about the configuration of cloud resources. It's a huge attack surface. Um, we're not trying to do what Splunk does. We're not trying to do what Datadog does. We're focused on a specific problem all the way across the SDLC. And, uh, you know, I, personally, those are the kinds of tools that, that I like, and that's why we perhaps in part built it that way. But these big one-stop one shop, here's, here's your security platform. Um, in my experience, that's the stuff executives like the sound of, but I've rarely seen it do a whole heck of a lot of good. I, I think the world's too complex today, right? And there, there's the complexity that we deal with software, even beyond software supply chain and developers, the, the cybersecurity, you know, uh, uh, challenge is a complex one. But I want to bring another point up to both of you and get your thoughts on it. DevOps has been incredibly successful over the last eight or nine years, right? It's why we're here today. Um, part of the issue with DevOps, though, is hey, let's throw it on the developer's plate. Testing, we'll let the developers do more testing. Security, it's time they start doing some security, those developers. At what point do we put too many straws on the developer's back? Right? Never. And at what Never. Never. Spoken like a true security person, right? I'm not though. I'm a developer. Um, you know, m m more than security. Uh, you know, I I've kind of watched this. I've been talking about this for a while. You know, in, in in my career, I saw the the you know when we started out, there was a, a a department as big as engineering, and it was called the QA department, and we kind of hated each other. We hated them because they would only test the manual stuff and they never found interesting bugs they always found the, you know the things in the forms and stuff like that not the bugs that took customers down and they probably hated us because we just made bugs we didn't write you know good software um but you look around organizations today are there big huge qa departments no in fact most modern organizations there isn't one it doesn't mean we don't test our software it means you know the it became part of what modern software development uh is expected to do and it took a long time to get there. And it was partially driven by Agile and the fact that you couldn't manually test these things and, and all that kind of stuff. And you know, we've watched over the last 10 years that the same kind of thing has been happening with application security, uh, certainly from a dependency level, where in 2010, when I was talking to developers about the then struts one vulnerabilities, you know, the answer I got from, from pretty smart people that were in the open source community that understood well what was going on. But then when I talked to them about what was happening in their companies, they'd say things like, well, we have a security team and we have a firewall. So, you know, I just have to worry about that. I don't get GPL or AGPL. Uh, I can use anything I want um, to the point where now I think modern software developers recognize that um, through unfortunate instances like Equifax and, and other things that, you know, those decisions really matter. And so now we're starting to see, you know, development native tools like GitHub and, and uh, GitLab and other companies starting to include those kinds of capabilities that would have traditionally been, you know, in the realm of the security person. And, and why is that? I think it's for the same reason that in order to do stuff uh, better and faster and more integrated, you have to move it left into what development is doing. You can't you can't inspect quality into a car as it rolls off the factory. It's the same old old story that we've been talking about forever from Deming, right? And and um, 
so so in that world, all these kinds of things that influence how the software is built, what goes into the software, it's it's the developers that are at the front line of that. And if you don't empower them to make the proper decisions up front, you're going to forever be trying to chase it out. So, you know, I, I look at it as it, it's the same thing with the stuff that Fugue does with, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, picking the operating system and picking the size of the servers, that was clearly an ops thing, right? Development didn't really think about that. They might have opinions, but but it wasn't their job to provision the bare metal. Now in a world where it's all integrated and virtual and and I need to instantiate some part of that environment just to do my testing. Now it becomes part of what the developer is coding. They're coding the infrastructure. And so um, by definition now that problem has become part of what engineering has to do. You can't you can't come along later and, and define it, right? Um, so I think there's sort of, I kind of refer to it as the black hole. There's an event horizon where at some point things become important enough that it finally tips over and falls into development. And tools that support that, that aren't compatible with development, they get ejected back out the other side because developers don't have time for that. And so, you know, within the within the dependency management SCA, I feel like we've been circling around that event horizon for 10 years, where first it was the legal teams that were paying for it, then the security teams, now it's development teams. You know, So IAC is the next thing, the container definition kind of preceded it to some extent. Um, what's next? I don't know. Uh, look at anything that's being done to try and analyze applications after they're built. It's probably on a march towards that event horizon. That's That's how I've looked at it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, so, so Andreessen famously said, "Software is eating the world." Uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll add a, a thought to that of, of I think my own, which is that if anything is valuable to humans and it can be expressed as an API, it ultimately will be. <laughs> um, okay, that that the, the, the software eating the world means developers own a whole lot of responsibilities they didn't before. Now the good news is developers are lazy and automate the heck out of things compared to other types of people, right? I'm, I'm, I'm quipping that, you know, I think in the 90s there was like the four uh, merits of a programmer and one, one was laziness, you know, automate stuff. I don't wanna keep doing something manually. And so, uh, you know, the, the kind of reason that I got off my posterior and started Fugue is I realized well, now with APIs over infrastructure, we can we can employ computer science. We can employ software engineering. Well, computer science and software engineering, we've gotten very good at. So as the developers uh, inherit, and you know, it's it's funny, as, I'm also a developer, not a, not a, I mean, I, I'm a very security focused developer, but my background is software architecture and development, not like security analysis. Those guys drove me nuts. Uh, yeah, I wanted to write code. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'd get to my NIST 853 certification and accreditation, and it was just like fingernails on a chalkboard to me. But but automating those things is really cool because they serve a necessary function. And when you bring things over into the world of developers and stuff gets automated and, you know, we've got policies code all through Fugue, uh, now you know ahead of time whether something is correct. And programmers like to know if something is correct ahead of time, if their tools will tell them. Agreed. Agreed. Um, guys, I want another question that had popped up and kind of related to solo wins and then related to what we're talking about is, you know, in, in our quest to try to ditch stuff together and, and you know, a reliance on integration or one stop shopping. That was one of the issues at solo wins. It's, it's, a, it's frankly a supply chain issue. We learned in 2020 around uh, personal protection gear, when you have one supplier or one country supplying all of it, and that, that country goes south on you, you're, you're SOL, right? And you know when you have 450 of the Fortune 500, depending on one solution, and that solution winds up with a, you know, a software supply chain security issue, man, the havoc that's that gets you know reaped by that is crazy. What can we do to prevent that type of over reliance on one issue or or one one solution? I mean, 
Brian, I'm sure you'd love to have the whole Fortune 500 on Sonatype. But what, you know, from a security point Who of view. Who says we don't? <laughs> you know, <laughs> hey, if you want to make a statement, I, you know, it's, that's up to you. Um, but, uh, you know, what do we, what do we think there? Yeah, that's a that's a really meta problem, isn't it? Um, you know, I think there that there there's a couple of things that that we see. You know, I've seen this pendulum over my career certainly that, you know, the the software, the development ecosystem tends to oscillate between you know unified vendors and a collection of best of breed, and it 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 keeps reversing directions because once it gets to the extreme, you know, if, if you're looking at something like rational application development from IBM, right, where it took a bunch of best to breed, but then kind of slowed down the innovation of them, it was nice uh, for an, an integrated environment. But then when it got too far behind the open source tools, you saw, you know, rabble rouser developers just start using the best of breed tools. And then things like Hudson and Jenkins and you know, even cruise control back in the day started to 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 pick that apart. And then you got to this point where everything was kind of broken apart. And now you start to see it again, reassembling under the cloud vendors, um, you know, companies like GitLab and, and and these kinds of things. And I feel like that's that's the trend of the moment and it will reverse not too long from now. Um, you know, and, and I worry about integration from the perspective, like I said before, of of dumbing down, you know, the jack of all trades, master of none. I think that's a dangerous yeah. place to be in. So I look at I look at it more from that perspective. Um, yes, there is a risk um, in in uh, big uh, tools, um, but I think the, the that risk exists within the, the 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 open source dependencies. You know, I used to talk about it as it's a common mode failure when everybody's using Spring. And you're a bad guy. Where are you going to go spend your energy, right? You see the the, the attacks being perpetuated on the places where um, where the the masses are, um, and that that exists not just from the tools, but from the dependencies you're using too. I mean, you, where does it stop? How many different operating systems in the world are there really, right? How many different JVMs are there really, right? So, um, I I. Yeah, there's an argument to be made that having fewer different vendors reduces your attack surface. But if you happen to uh, win the unfortunate lottery on being the one that got attacked, then that's not going to feel great. But I don't feel like the answer is having 10 tools do the same thing because one, now you've made sure that if any 10 of them get attacked, so did you. Um, and also like Josh was talking about before, when the tools disagree, now politics involve and you actually don't have an effective process. So, you know, I, I'm not sure there's an easy silver bullet to, to, to this solar winds like problem. It's certainly not avoiding the good tools, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it, it is an extremely complex topic, right? And 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 not just in computing and like human history, if we become too dependent on one food, uh, yep, the wrong right. bug comes along and wipes out a big population. However, if you get a whole lot of caloric efficiency from that food, you can grow more population. And we see the same thing in computing where you know, uh, as Brian said, you know, if you limit the number of tools you're using, you're limiting attack surface, but you're probably increasing blast radius potential uh, because you, you've got it in more places. Um, humans are pretty good at recovering from these things and adjusting. We're really bad at strategic prevention. In my, in, that's my assessment. Um, and I think that uh, when you when you look at the solar winds hack right now, it seems kind of world ending. And who knows what our adversaries are are going to do with that? Uh, who knows? I mean, I was, uh, it was it was funny. I was at a um, a, a security conference, and uh, uh, somebody mentioned a, a guy who had actually been in NIST for a long time. So if this is going back a little ways, but he said. Uh, uh, do, do you remember when all the security clearance databases got stolen by the Chinese? And, well, yes, of course I remember because they got my data. Uh, well, do you remember the the very next thing that got hacked was Ashley Madison? Well, why is that? Because if somebody's got a clearance and they're on Ashley Madison, they're vulnerable to blackmail. So who knows what these foreign actors are doing with solar winds? But it it isn't an intrinsic, you know, socially and in the in the in the broader world. But as far as computing goes, uh, it, it wasn't a, a fundamentally destructive hack, right? Um, I worry about that more 
as we look at the uh, cloud service providers, you know, uh, uh, Thomas Watson Sr. Is, is said to have said in 1943, the total global market for computers is going to be about five. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he might have been right in a way. There's going to be AWS and Azure and GCP and, you know, there's going to be five big global distributed computers. And we've seen uh, that they're quite good at, at limiting that blast radius. So I think there's a tension. I think there's always a tension. Um, I remember, uh, you know, just with programming languages, for example, in the 90s, it, it, it was either it, you were writing games in C++ or you were writing Java or you were writing in the early aughts or you were writing .NET in the early aughts. And now, you know, you see, uh, and I'm particularly happy about this one, closure out there, re resuscitating lists. And you get lots of more diversity. So as Brian said, there is this ebb and flow. Uh, and uh, and hopefully we improve over time. I believe we are improving over time. I, I, I agree. Guys, we, we've got well, about maybe 15 minutes, a little bit less left. And, you know, we, we've, we kind of, you know, pussyfooted around a little bit about the Sonatype Fugue Partnership. I want to make sure we make clear to the folks from a functionality point of view, what exactly we're talking about? How do they leverage it? How do they find out more about it? So I, I, I realize you're both CTO, co-founders of your company and founders, but if, if you wouldn't mind, let's take a few minutes digging in on this, right? What, what What's Fugue and Sonatype doing together? Uh, hey, hey well, Brian, since it's your product, why don't, why don't, uh, why don't you take that first? Sure. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like I said, our product is already uh, integrating across the lifecycle and analyzing um, either the built artifacts or the source with the manifest to understand what dependencies are going into it. Right. So uh, a typical integration pattern is to hook us up to your source control repositories in GitHub and scan the stuff and also scan it when it gets built by Jenkins and and these kinds of things so that we can provide multiple checkpoints to make sure what you said you were going to build is what actually got into the build once the binaries were downloaded as an example right making sure the final product matches the the manifest um, as we're doing that some of the source files in there might be terraform scripts as an example um, and so when a customer has both uh, pieces of this what we're able to do is use the fugue capabilities and their their rule set to do the analysis of uh, the Terraform scripts and and uh, some of the other the other types of names escape me, but Josh knows them um, to to indicate uh, side by side. Hey, you know, developer, um, you're using a, a known vulnerable version of Pick a Project Spring, and also your IAC configuration is going to create a server that has no is wide open to the world, or your firewall ports are misconfigured, or did you mean to fire up 10,000 versions of the server? Maybe you didn't mean to do that, right? Um, so, so we can take the analysis, the deep understanding that they have of, of the, the build plan for the infrastructure, find the violations, the things that are dangerous or questionable, and surface that all back to the developer in the same place. That's the gist of what we're doing. So that that that's why I described it before as sort of the control plane, and then being able to add tools like Fugue to expand, you know, the the, the horizontally the knowledge of the things we can have to say about what's going across that control plane. So Josh, I'll let you add in, anything I missed. I think you covered it pretty well. You know, uh, yeah, the, this IAC is a new kind of code in terms of you know. We're we're used to thinking about uh, code as something that gets like you know built, linked, packaged in a step. With infrastructure as code, you're like summoning whole infrastructure with tons of side effects that you might not be aware of until after it's done. And so uh, the approach has to be a little bit different, but the problem is the same. And that's why we're so excited about this partnership is to put those things next to each other is the right way to give this information to developers is to say you know, here, here's a list of issues that you should be aware of. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, people, uh, those security guys that used to frustrate me uh, would always, you know, say, you developers don't care about security. It's like, no, we do. We're just not, not gonna memorize a phone book of NIST rules. Uh, I want a something to give me actionable insights back. And that's what this uh, uh, product is going to do um, uh, with, uh, with Sonotype for IAC, just like they already do with um, application components. 
Excellent. Guys, before we go further, uh, I have a habit of, of forgetting to do this. So I want to do it now. The, the four winners of the Amazon gift cards for today are Brenda B, Eliza L, Geraldine G, and Zachary C. Our, our uh, backstage team here will reach out to each of you and I think we probably have your email address and get you out your Amazon gift cards. Congratulations. Guys, we have a little under 10 minutes left. I want to bring up a few other, being that it's you know January, we're looking at 2021. One of the big things we're doing is, or we're seeing here is, is GitOps. It's rising to the top of everyone's kind of you know attention span. And in, in many ways, people are talking about it sort of replacing the CICD kind of life cycle or pipeline that we've kind of got used to here. What what uh what effect is it hype? Is it real? How much, you know, it, it you know it's not about DevOps anymore. It's about GitOps, people are saying. How does that affect security and, and plans and, and going forward? Brian, I know Sona Type already played in Git in the various, yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, I feel like the term is a bit hype. It's real. Uh, it's just the net the, the next implementation of shifting some of this stuff left. I think. Um, you know, I I don't I don't look at it as like a watershed kind of moment and more just an incremental shift in that same general direction. I think um, you know some of the GitOps stuff has the potential to be better in that when you're using Git and, and these types of things, it inherently is a version control system, which means auditing and logging is like what it's doing um, in ways that it may be hard to figure out who pushed the button on build tool X, right, in the past. If it's in if it's in Git, it's it's all recorded uh, for posterity. So I think there are, there are incremental improvements that you get out of that. But I, I don't think, other than a, a new term, just to make it sound new, I don't I don't feel like it's that different, really. Yeah, uh, I, I I agree. You know, our industry has a way of wanting to uh, uh, put terms around things that are just kind of natural evolutions, or in many cases, things that have been there for a long time. Even DevOps, you know, I, I think back to my early days and, you know, when we write programs, we maintained the programs in production. You know, um, it wasn't like we right. would kick them over the fence to an ops team, at least not not in the environments I was. We, same team that built, wrote the code, ran the servers. And, you know, we built multi-million user per day web applications that way. So so I think DevOps is a is a reaction to the overcomplication of how folks started trying to, you know, unpack those 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 aspects of, you know, there's dev and there's operations, there's QA, there's security, all these things. We should get specialist teams, and and then that turned out to not be great. And so, in many ways, we're kind of going back to something a little simpler, um, where uh, the domain knowledge is more concentrated. I think I think GitOps is kind of similar. It's like, do do we really need that much tooling? If we're if we're serious about making everything code, if we're serious about not having a lot of operations in the mix, but just having uh, everything in a repo and that what is in the repo defines what's in the in the actual environment, then do you need all that interstitial tooling? Um, you know, I, I think it's cool where it works. I think like anything, it's a compromise. And we'll find out which are the appropriate places uh, to use it as people uh, experiment with it and have success and burn themselves, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things I worry about is, you know, with with the extra rope becomes lots of danger. right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the, you can create some monsters uh, out of anything. Build, build tooling, you know, Maven was a reaction to that, trying to put some sanit sanity on top of, uh, you know, crazy ant file like behaviors that preceded it um you know and and uh with GitOps, there's certainly an opportunity for that crazy wiring to happen that becomes really hard to unwind so i'm sure at some point there will be some tools um doing things similar to what you guys are doing josh <laughs> i'm trying to look at the whole big picture and pull all the strings and go whoa that's not what you meant when you run this thing here it does all these things over there um you know but the 
your comment about how you used to run the the programs kind of reminded me like yeah we did too um mm -hmm. just like we did what looked a lot like scrum or even Kanban before even Scrum had a term. And so I wonder if when something gets a label put on it, what it really means is this is things that smaller uh, smaller teams, uh, more forward-leaning teams have been doing, and we have to put a label on it so we can get enterprises to try to emulate the behavior. Maybe that's what that so really is all about. Uh, and so we can start <laughs> well-paid consultancies to teach them how to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, someone, someone's got to do it. <laughs> you know, I, I want to jump back into some questions from from our audience. Josh, you had mentioned earlier that you worked at a place in the, uh, I think it was in the federal space, where you know you weren't allowed to use the, the editor you wanted to use, right? They they really kind of done that. Uh, Janice from our audience says she's worked at a defense contractor where you had to get approval before you could send an email to anyone outside the company. A little bit extreme, but. You know, yeah. how do you decide where do you draw the line on that kind of stuff, yeah. right? How much is too much? How much is... That's kind of what I was referring to before. You know, I saw so many horrifying practices, you know, companies that were maintaining whitelists of dependencies to use. And I I, I, I see it less now, but I, I, I do come across it. And I, and, I, and I tell those people the following, and they don't like to hear it, but I stand by it 100%. I said, look, if you've implemented that, one of two things are actually happening. Either you're really good at actually enforcing that, and there are some companies and some places where maybe that's warranted. And and when you are in that camp and your your list, your approved list is fully accurate, then you've probably harmed your ability to do innovation because you've broken the back of developers. They just throw their hands up and go, why am I using this old thing? Because oh, it's on the approved list and it's gonna take six weeks to get a new version. I don't have that kind of time and I really don't care that much. So, so if you're good at enforcing it, then you're hurting your innovation. The other camp is, <laughs> you're kidding yourself. That list is nowhere near an accurate reflection of, of uh, what is actually being used. Um, and and they don't like to hear that either because it basically means you're not good at enforcing it, but the unintended consequence is you actually haven't hurt your ability to do <laughs> rapid development. Um, and so, you know, in times like the things like when Equifax, you know, became public and the solar winds, there will be an overreaction of companies trying to lock things down. Um, we had heard a, a large global bank, somebody seriously saying, well, maybe we should just disconnect all of our development from the internet as a way of stopping these things from happening. And it's like, yeah, that basically means you can't do any modern software development anymore ever again. That is not the answer, right? Um, and so it, 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 there's this constant tension and that that's what we've been trying to solve. How do you get to a place where you can allow innovation to occur? Maybe even accelerate innovation because you've removed the pretend guardrails and replace them with actual guardrails that that are useful but stay out of your way um you know and 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 uh that companies exist somewhere along that spectrum from the co completely locked down to the wild wild west the answer is you got to be in the middle somewhere yeah i i i, I would i would uh, describe the situation as probably slightly more dire uh that all organizations who try to impose those things at an enterprise level have both of the problems you've said. They're slowing down their developers and there are developers getting around it somehow. That's right. I've never seen a scenario where that wasn't true, except in certain national security environments. Now, I, right. I wanna make an, an exception for, uh, you know, a lot of people disparage government. Uh, there's certainly a lot of frustrating things in working in government, particularly in uh, secure applications. Uh, but in, in business, uh, the way you get fired is by not making money, right? In government, the way you get fired is by making an error. And, and that goes all the way up to being dragged in front of Congress, you know, the admiral being dragged in front of Congress. Well, I'm out if the admiral gets dragged in front of Congress. And that has a very strong cultural impact. I'm not here to, to, to debate the merits of that. Um, so it's kind of an unusual scenario as compared to others. I, I think that from my perspective anyway, if you believe that people, for the most part, want to do the right thing, the problem isn't how many tools they're choosing. You know, at, at Fugue, I mentioned we, we go through an approval process. Somebody wants to pull in a new open source project, we look at it. Nine times out of 10, the answer is yes. 
And it's it, we never say, well, we have this other thing over there that does something similar. Like that that never crosses our mind. We're just trying to figure out, hey, we hired this person. They're smart. We want them to have independence. We want them to uh, it, it be inspired and care about what they're doing and maybe show us where we can improve. Is it safe? Is it legal? <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, it's a balancing act, but, uh, you know, I've had so many organizations tell me back when I was at AWS and here at Fugue, we do everything through the CICD pipeline. And now with Fugue, we'll turn Fugue on for a couple of days. And they're like, wow, there's a lot going on. <laughs> it's not yeah. going through the CICD pipeline. <laughs> right. That's right. It's the same thing when we'd have people tell us, um, you know, hey, we have this list. We can tell you exactly what's in there. We've got 800 components on our approved list. And then we come in and we actually start assessing their applications and find out it's 10 or 100 times that. And they go, wow, we, we didn't know, you know. Understood. Guys, we are at the top of the hour. This is one incredibly quick. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but on the other hand, Brian, Josh, thank you so much. This is a great conversation. I think we hit on so many different subjects. We we hit all of the questions in the audience, so we've answered them. Just a success on, on a lot of different levels. Thanks so much. I look forward to the rest of this series. I think CPO Talk, sponsored by Sonotypes, I think it's going to be great. Um, to our audience, thanks for joining us. If you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry you missed it live, but hopefully you're getting a lot out of it on demand. It's a great conversation. Uh, many thanks to Sonotype. Thanks to my team here at MediaOps for, for uh, all the support. And uh, we'll see you soon on another DevOps or MediaOps.com webinar. Thanks, everyone. It's Alan Schimmel. We're out. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.